Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody all around the world. We uh, thank you for joining us today as part of GMAT's Club live video series. Uh, today we're going to cover interviews, NBA interviews, and specifically uh, with a specific eye toward the Chicago Booth and MIT Sloan interviews. So we're uh, pleased to have you join us. Interviews, if you were a round two applicant, uh, which I imagine if you're joining this call, uh, you probably were, and specifically if you're interested in Booth and Sloan, because it's been kind of uh, raining interview invites in, in recent days and recent weeks, and it really is that kind of hot time of year, especially uh, in round two. In round two, uh, slight tangent, but you're all living it and aware, aware of it. Um, in round two, deadlines are very, very concentrated in the beginning of January, as you all likely experienced. And so the interview invites, we can we can see a similar effect with that, um, where a lot of interview invites are happening all at once. And there's really a pretty tight window of weeks in which you're doing your interviews. We, we're working with an applicant. Uh, I'm working with an applicant who has uh, four interviews just this week. Um, so it can get quite busy and you try to manage your way through and you try to prepare and you do try to scale that preparation um, from one interview to the next. And we'll, we'll, we'll have an eye on that uh, today because each school's interview is different. They can be a little bit, so, some can be a little bit different. Some can be very different. Um, but a lot of the corpus for many, many schools, including Booth and Sloan to an extent, uh, a lot of the corpus or baseline or fundamental prep or question types can be similar between interviews. And we'll look at we'll look at a lot of that today. So thank you again for joining. This is, by the way, becoming part of something of a series, I, I guess you could say. I've done several interview prep videos, several videos for GMAT Club, as uh, many others have as well. But now many in the way of interviews, uh, some related to just broader interview prep interview advice. Uh, a, a couple of, in round one, I guess it was a couple of months ago now, uh, I did one focused or oriented more toward Berkeley Haas and Kellogg. And this one today, again, it'll be oriented a little more toward Booth and Sloan. So uh, we're putting together a little bit of a series here and um, building from one to the next. So thank you again for being here. Pleased to have you with us. We'll go through some of these um, some of these slides. What we're going to go through it, are, are just some of the basics and things to remember entering basically any MBA interview, some of the basics and things to keep in mind for the Chicago Booth and MIT Sloan MBA interviews, um, uh, some of the common question types, and then even some specific patterns that we might be able to discern uh, between those two schools in particular. So let's proceed on through. Uh, Avanti Prep, just as a quick note, uh, does offer an interview prep service. Our standard interview prep service is actually three hours in duration, which is very, very thorough and comprehensive, you know, not only in its duration, but also in its, you know, in the actual experience itself. You can read about that um, and how thorough and detailed uh, and comprehensive it is in many of the testimonials and our reviews on GMAT Club. And we absolutely invite you uh, to do that. The What that three hours includes is an extended mock interview in the style of the school for which we're preparing together, for which you're preparing. Um, I say extended because as we'll see in a moment, a lot of times in your real MBA interview, the actual period during which the interviewer is asking you questions as the interviewee, it might be like 30 minutes, 35 minutes, some cases even slightly less. Um, we'll do an extended version of that. We want to cover more. We want to practice more. We usually spend, you know, a good part of the first hour, almost the whole first hour uh, on an extended mock interview. In a sense, it's like double the amount of questions or double the amount of time you might experience in the real interview. So it would include an extended mock interview um, in the style of the school for which you're preparing. That, again, is very important. Um, and we're going to go through some of those school-specific themes and observations today for Booth and Sloan. Uh, and then we do a question-by-question question coaching feedback and strategy se uh, s session. What worked well? What didn't work well? Um, is that the right story for a behavioral question? How do you structure your, I mean, anything and everything. How do you structure your responses which strengths should you choose? Two of them sounded good. One didn't. Um, why MBA? Why? All these questions we're about to go through today, you'll get a flavor for that. Um, 
because it's three hours, we usually divide it between back to back days, 90 minutes, 90 minutes or something like that. Um, and the, the one additional note is if you are, I know this could get a little bit tricky because we're already kind of on February 16th. Um, but we do ask people to try if you're scheduling interview, get invited to interview at Sloan, let's say, or wherever, and you are scheduling your interview and you would like to work together on interview prep. We ask that you do try to budget enough time. Like don't schedule your interview for it's, you know, get invited to interview on like a Wednesday today and you schedule your interview for mon this Monday. Well, that doesn't leave leaves us a couple of business days there to, uh, to schedule your interview prep and they've, they've likely already been booked. So we would suggest scheduling, um, a little further out, like, you know, LBS comes to mind as a school where I think you have until like March 13th or so, or first couple of weeks of March to do your interview. You don't need to push to the last day, but just give enough time if you want to work together so that we could, we could schedule our sessions and you can incorporate the feedback from our sessions before your, uh, real thing. We will, uh, add a coupon code to the website. Um, so you could save five, 5% with coupon code, uh, right there in our interview prep Pricing is actually discounted relative to our state pre discounted relative to our standard hourly services pricing. Uh, and then you get this discount on top of that. So we invite you certainly avantiprep.com uh, to uh, sign up for interview prep. So some of the basics, Chicago Booth and MIT Sloan. I think for the most part, both of these schools, especially Booth, fit the kind of traditional MBA interview bill. Sloan maybe a little a little different. I mean, they used to cast themselves as something called a, a BEI, behavioral event based interview. It still has a behavioral orientation, but not exclusively so. And again, we'll get into the details of this. And by the way, Booth has behavioral questions too, and so do many many other schools. Uh, it's just maybe a little bit of a subtlety in terms of the ratio, you know, Sloan, half your questions might be behavioral and Booth, like a third of them might be behavioral. Um, but, uh, you know, they both, for the most part, will fit common patterns of MBA interviews. Um, maybe people could quibble with the semantics on that, but you'll see what I mean when we go into the details here. Uh, some of the basics to keep in mind, both schools interview by invitation only. That, again, is most common. You, you People joining this call have probably lived this and know this well, so I'm preaching to the choir here. There are other schools out there, of course, like Kellogg, um, which tries to interview pretty much everybody. Uh, and at schools where, you know, an applicant can initiate an interview or you can interview during an, uh, an open period like at Duke Fuqua, or you could apply early and <clears throat> guarantee yourself an interview. Tuck had that if you applied by September 1st or um, Darden comes to mind as well. But here, kind of the classic, you apply and then you're invited to interview. We'll talk, by the way, about how that, like, how does the interview fit into this whole paradigm? Like you already applied and now you're invited to interview. What's the evaluation look like and feel like? We'll talk about that uh, on the next slide. Booth, here's a little bit of a difference. Booth uses student or alumni interviewers. The students are, I believe they call them admissions fellows at Booth uh, who are trained to interview and do other things related to admissions. Uh, so student or al the alumni interviewers are trained <laughs> as well in some capacity. Booth student or alumni interviewers MIT Sloan admissions committee interviewers. So you actually will have an, a person from the adcom conducting your interview. Uh, understandably, I guess you could say it might feel a little more intimidating, but you know, don't worry about that. It's uh, it's all normal and everybody's doing it. So, but that is one difference. Another difference, a little bit, is the timing of these interviews. Um, you know, booth people will typically estimate about forty-five minutes to an hour. MIT Sloan call it 30 to 45. These are subtleties for the most part. Um, I think the observation here, and one to keep in mind, by the way, for other interviews as well. I think a lot of times if you, like with, with an adcom interview, or um, 30 to 45 minutes, especially MIT Sloan, they really, they kind of try to keep it in a box, you know, in a time box. Um, with Chicago Booth or any school where you have a student or alum interviewing you, I just think there can be more variability. There's a wider array, a much, much, several fold wider uh, array of people with whom you could potentially be interviewing. And so it's just more variable. If you're interviewing with an alum and it's the end of their work day and they have nothing else to get to and they actually really enjoy talking about their experience in the Chicago booth, 
that conversation could go a little longer. Uh, same thing with a student. Sometimes students interviewing you during their school day, though, maybe they run into class and they have they do have to keep it in more of a time box. But just a little bit of an observation there on timing. Uh, I think some of those alum, when you ask questions at the end, do you have any questions for me? Uh, sometimes that with a student or alum can turn into more of an organic conversation. And that's where you could see some, I mean, sometimes people pre-COVID, you could interview with an alum in person at a coffee shop on a Saturday in theory. And that could really, you know, you might sit there for some of those you hear go for an hour, hour 15, if you have good rapport and good conversation. So um, there is a little bit, and maybe we could talk about this toward the end of our conversation. When you do ask questions at the end, um, and for those of you who might be new to this, interviews almost always will end with, do you have any questions for me? Have your questions. And then you kind of have to read the tea leaves about, is this turning into an organic conversation, especially if it's a student or alum? And, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to push that. You have to be respectful of their time. Maybe even ask, do we have time for one more question? Things like that. But, you know, if, if on the other end, if it's turning into a conversation, um, you don't want to necessarily cut it short either. So you have to use your, your social cues and instincts on that. Um, another difference here, Chicago Booth's interview is what's known as blind. We put that in quotes, um, blind to your application. The interviewer has, of course, seen your resume, uh, but they've only seen your resume. And uh, whereas MIT Sloan is one of the few schools out there that conducts what's called a comprehensive interview, uh, where the interviewer has, in fact, read through your entire application and could, in theory, ask, you know, anything about it, or at the very least has full context, full insight into everything you've submitted. Whereas, again, Booth, more commonly, from many other schools as well, has only seen your resume. Uh, a little fun fact out there, the only school I could think of that strays from either of these, Darden does a completely blind interview where the interviewer hasn't even uh, seen your resume. So that's an interesting one as well. Uh, interesting little fun interview fact. Some other basics to keep in mind. And again, we're going to get into the questions, the question patterns, and some of the school specific observations. Um, but, you know, go go into these and really a lot of what we're going to do speaks to some of those top uh, bullets there. But research the school, research its interview format, research its interview reports. There are several resources through which you could do that, the most prominent of which would be GMAT Club. Um, GMAT Club has a page called Interview Debriefs. Uh, I'll throw the link into the comments or, or put it in the private chat and maybe it can be shared by our admin. Um, but if you, whether the link shared or not, just Google GMAT club interview debriefs and you will see actual interview reports from real life interviews. And it's just to give you a flavor, you know, you're doing what anybody would do walking into any interview for a job or a politician before a debate, you are trying to predict or at least get a feel for the potential questions or some of the question patterns and question types that you are going to encounter. And there's the link up on the screen now. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to take a closer look at that together to give you, I think, an even sharper eye and more tools to do that for Booth and Sloan or any other school you're interviewing with. Um, dress. This question comes up more, by the way, uh, more and more in recent years. The default dress code is absolutely business formal, suit and tie where appropriate or business formal, whatever that you know means to you. Uh, but it's not business casual. The only time I would, uh, the only time I would support somebody wearing business casual is if the school explicitly said in their interview email, interview instructions, interview FAQs, that business casual is okay. Even then there's an argument to be made to just Stay, wear business formal anyway. Uh, you can never be overdressed. I mean, unless you're in maybe a tuxedo or something for a situation like this. But business formal is the default. I know there's a lot, you know, we've been working from home, a lot of people for the last couple of years. And there was already kind of this casualization uh, in society and professional society. But this, you know, it's an MBA interview. It's a business interview. Um doesn't mean your personality shouldn't come across. In fact, some of the, the art of this on your end is to be serious and a, a serious and interesting professional while also letting some of that personality come across and letting your get trying to get your energy through the camera. But the, the dress is business formal as the default. 
I think really without equivocation. I've heard in recent years, um, schools mark people down for being underdressed in interviews. So again, only wear business casual, my view at least, only wear business casual if it is explicitly allowed by the school. If it's not mentioned at all, it's business formal. Um, video, check your connection, your lighting, your positioning, your sound, all that good stuff. Um, uh, you know, you don't want to make sure you have a, they can't hear you. So test these things out in advance. You're, you're, you want to be smooth on interview day. Uh, eye contact I've got highlighted there. That's a tricky one in the video world. Um, people ask sometimes too, and, and, and it's even a little bit imperfect the way I have it set up here. I usually, so we want to create, they say, should I look at you or, or look at the video screen or look at the camera? The short answer is basically look at the camera. Um, I know it's a little weird because then you're not looking at the person, but you want to create the sensation of eye contact through the video. Uh, what I usually do though, because it is it is a little weird if you're like looking, the camera's at the top of your screen, you're looking up at the camera, then you can't see the person, you lose that interactive kind of feeling. What I usually do, the system, the video system here makes this a little bit hard, but I usually try to take, so let's say I'm looking at, you know, the person I'm interviewing uh, or the person I'm, who's interviewing me, let's say I'm the, the applicant. Uh, I try to take my video screen and sort of minimize it a bit and put it as close to the camera as possible, like right underneath the camera. Um, so that when I'm looking at the person interviewing me, my eyes are basically trained on the camera and it creates the sensation of eye contact. So that is kind of an interesting quirk. You don't want, if you're looking at them and they are a moving you know, the screen right now down to like the middle of my screen. Well, I'm still looking at what would be the interviewer, but it looks really weird for you. So let's get it up sort of as like as close as you can. Again, it's a little, the system I'm in here prevents me from doing it perfectly, but um, uh, that's probably a little bit better. But yeah, try to get that video, whatever you're looking at, uh, try to get it up near the camera, at least as close as you can uh, to try to create the sensation of eye contact again with the Caveat that I'm probably being a little bit imperfect with it here right now. Um, positioning, by the way, too. You know, we don't want to be too far back. We don't want to be too far forward. Uh, my top of my head's getting cut off um, a little bit here. I don't have a, get a little bit of an extra haircut. Uh, but, yeah, try to be square and centered within the, uh, uh, within the screen. Not too close where you're crowding it. Not too far back where you feel kind of meek. Um, so, that's uh, positioning and camera and such. Evaluation. I mentioned a little bit of this a moment ago. You're, so your interview, it's tempting to feel like you get invited to interview, right? You went through the application. You submitted your essays and whatever else. You had to submit videos for MIT Sloan, um, recommendations, your application. You submitted all of that. It can be tempting and even natural to feel like, oh, well, I, I've been invited to interview, so I've gotten through the app part and now i'm being invited to interview and how i do in my interview is going to be the determining factor in whether i get in that's a misnomer actually um in essentially all cases i can think of the interview so they're interested in you great job on your app it is hard to get interviews at these schools so congratulations on it the interview now is an extra data point. And actually with both of these schools, there's a couple of extra data points because Booth, in addition to the interview, has you submit a 60 second video uh, due in about six days. Um, and MIT Sloan, in addition to the interview, has you submit two 250 word essays, one of which includes a uh, data visualization. So, um, it, you know, there's a little extra. So there are more data points is, is, is the point. And the interview itself, again, it's it's an extra data point that's being collected here. And that interview report is going to go back in the pile or back in the basket with your application. And when they render a decision on you, it's going to be the totality of that. So, you know, don't, um, it's not like the interview is the be all end all. Now it's obviously very important, but uh, you can have scenarios certainly where somebody interviews rather well, but you know, maybe their application and their stats and stuff were still fringy and they don't get in or they get waitlisted or something. And then, you know, the opposite case where somebody maybe has a good, okay, good enough interview, but their stats and their application were and recommendations were amazing and they do get in. So it's not like everyone made it past the app and now we're just fighting the interview fight. The interview goes back in the pile. It's another data point. Um, other little tips and stuff, you know, show up early, uh, even though it's remote, um, 
have your photo ID handy. Some schools will ask for it. Uh, have your, you know, I say three here, but have some primary questions ready at the end. Be cognizant of time as well. You don't want to push that. You kind of have to read the tea leaves again. Be respectful of their time. Maybe even say something like, I, you want to, you know, I realize we're coming up on um, on our uh, the end of our time together. Is it okay if I ask one more question? But then if you're all, flip that now, if it's like an interviewer and it seems like they're loving talking about their school, don't cut things short either. Um, how much more time do you have? Just be polite, self-aware. Use your normal human instincts as you would on any kind of professional or scheduled call with respect to that and the questions at the end and send a thank you email after the interview. Uh, it doesn't have to be some lights out thing. It's not an essay. I mean, HBS has the post reflection, post interview reflection. That's a different kind of ball of wax. These are sort of formalities. It's the polite and professional thing to do. Um, you can reference perhaps a couple of specific things or things you talked about in the interview. You can reiterate your interest, but it should not be too long. Um, short and sweet with a little bit of specificity is typically sufficient. Uh, but do send the thank you email. Uh, you know, we have some basic frame when we work with applicants on interview prep, we do share some very basic frameworks just to give you a little bit of like a seed or a little bit of guidance that you can run with, um, as you draft your thank you email, uh, be confident, but humble, avoid self-centeredness, avoid self-aggrandizement, avoid take, 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 and me, me, me you want, especially when you talk about the schools, it's, it's, it's you, it's the school for you and it's you for them. Um, there's a mutualism to that. It's a two way street. So don't just be a taker. Also think about how you can give and what you can give and what you can contribute and what you can bring. Um, a lot of these interviews, I guess there's a little bit of a subtlety here too. It's why I highlighted it in a different color. Um, booth at a lot of schools, you will hear the interview referred to as conversational I think that's a little bit of a misnomer too, to be honest. They, what, what people mean when they say conversational is the interviewer is not there to like trick you or intimidate you. Uh, so it, there is a friend, they want you to be comfortable and share the best you, share your stories and share your interest in the school and share how you can contribute. They're not there to scare you or intimidate you. Um, what we don't want to interpret conversational to mean though, is that it's like a two way conversation between friends. Um, like, you would in a social event where you ask some questions and they ask some questions and it's kind of a 50 50 in this situation. And in, in pretty much all MBA interviews, uh, there'll be some pleasantries exchanged in the beginning. Hi, how are you? Where are you? You know, how's it going? The weather, a few minutes of that, um, pleasantries exchanged in the beginning and then you're into the session. Uh, and they are the one asking you the questions. They're driving the bus and you'll have time at the end to ask them questions. Uh, the MIT Sloan interview, because it's ad comms who are interviewing you, you hear anecdotally, some people say, you know, they were very, uh, my interviewer was very stoic, didn't respond much facially or verbally to my responses. So you hear a little bit more of that maybe it's a little less quote unquote conversational in tone. Don't be intimidated by that. Don't let it put you off. Um, it's just part of, you know, that's just, a, it can be a stylistic thing. It can be specific to a certain interviewer. Uh, second bullet at the top, by the way, Inhale the propaganda of the school. This is a tongue-in-cheek phrase that I use. Going into these interviews, get to know these schools, the ins, the outs, the values, the resources. Um, like, just immerse yourself in the days leading up to the interview with what that school stands for. Obviously, you, you need to weave some of these things into your why Sloan or why Booth response. But you also just, you know, you there's something kind of implicit or organic about that as well. You just want to live it and breathe it. Um, and if you're watching the videos and reading the blog posts and talking to people, you know, from the school, maybe some of whom you talked to when you were applying, that's just a fantastic way to feel, feel the school. Yeah. You got to have them on the tip of your tongue, but you're also, there's a certain feel quality to that. So immerse yourself in it, heading in. Common MBA interview question types. These are my own, this is, these are my own classifications, but I think it does lay the foundation or framework uh, for, for us to categorize or think about or organize your preparation for any MBA interview. And again, we're going to look at these both at a kind of general level, as well as specific, some of the specific patterns we might observe, or you might observe for um, Booth and Sloan. 
the, the, again, these are my own classifications. It's not like schools out there call them this. Uh, and it's a way where if you are about to start your preparation or you're in the midst of your preparation for MBA interviews, Booth Sloan or otherwise, you could look at interview reports and categorize the questions in these buckets. And there's, in some cases, kind of a certain certain patterns within each bucket uh, or certain ways, like with behavioral questions, a certain structure that you'd likely want to kind of adopt for any such behavioral question. Behavioral questions, by the way, means tell me about a time when. It's an example-driven question. Uh, both of these schools in have behavioral questions in their interviews. Again, MIT Sloan, at least like, reputationally light, might lean a little more into them, but Booth asks them too. So it's and, and, and Sloan asks other questions that are not just behavioral questions. So uh, really, for both schools and many many schools, behavioral questions are part of the uh, part of the game. So core questions, self awareness questions, behavioral questions, and then other miscellaneous or closing questions. Uh, it's not like a total catch all, but it will give you some structure. Where if you read through interview reports, you can almost build out a document that clusters the questions you see into these different buckets and you might even be able to observe you know relative frequencies uh how often does a certain school ask that question or seem to ask that question or that question or a certain type of behavioral question um does a certain school seem to merge together a couple of the core questions or omit one of them uh is there some other oddball question that a certain school likes to ask uh, you know there are a couple of schools out there that like to ask where else have you applied um you might observe things like that this was a little less, or what is your backup plan to your career goals? Neither of those are, are very common here. They could ask, anything could. Uh, neither of those are very, but those are examples of like one-offs. And for any school, you're going to observe potential one-offs that uh, seem to come up. Core questions. What do I mean by core questions? I call this the core five. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, up there on the screen. Okay, yeah, the bottom is not, I don't think, uh, getting cut off. So core questions, the core five, uh, I think no matter what MBA interview you are walking into, you want to be ready for these. Tell me about yourself or walk me through your resume is kind of like the most common opening. Now, MIT Sloan Booth tends to ask that as an opening question. MIT Sloan once in a while does, but really you'll see if you look at the interview reports and just, I mean, honestly, this isn't like uh, any uh, kind of uh, trade secret. If you talked to any anybody, you know, if you did your homework at all, a pretty simple Googling or a conversation with students, you would be pretty quickly where I think they even say it in videos. Um, we typically start our interviewers, interviews, MIT Sloan does, by asking applicants uh do you have any updates are there any major any major updates to your application since you've applied or has anything you know any new any recent news in your life some sort of update question uh to start things off so already there we see let's lay down we should lay down or be ready for these core five for any school but there as we overlay school specific interview preparation we see already with this first question, a little bit of a different trend for a certain school that we're covering today, MIT Sloan. But core five more generally, and you know, for Booth, tell me about yourself or walk me through your resume. I personally approach those the same. They're semantically a little bit different. I approach the response the same. Walk me through your resume does not literally mean walk me through every single line or bullet or like thing on your resume. It is a it is code for introduce yourself. Both of these are code for introduce yourself. And those introductions should be, you know, two, two and a half, maybe max three minutes in length. I tell people oftentimes it's the movie trailer version of you. It's not the detail. You might, you're going to weave some highlights in. Um, I even kind of note here in the second bullet under that category for each job you've had, and you got to be careful with this. If you've had many, many, many jobs, let's say you've had like two jobs. Um, for each job you've had, I'd be curious to know how did you transition into or why did you end up at that job? Why were you interested in it? What does the company do? Especially important if it's not clear, you know, you work in a smaller company or something. What do you do? And then some highlights or like a highlight, one or two highlights maybe. And then do that again for the second job. So you got kind of middle pieces there, job one, job two. Before that, let's hear about that where I have it listed opening, like, uh, you know, 
a little briefly, like, where are you from? Where did you go to college? What did you study? Why did you study that? Maybe some one or two things you were involved in in college. That's kind of your intro, job one, job two. And then an outro, which could be something like outside of work, I'm really involved in or really passionate about. So think about how you want to structure that answer. Consider the parts. Uh, I just gave kind of a four-parter, I guess you could say, the intro um, and college and why you studied what you studied and anything interesting about college that you were involved in, job one, job two, outro, which would be outside of work, what you're involved in, and you want to fit that. Now, that won't be the same for everybody, and there are probably other approaches to it as well, uh, but uh, you know, try to fit. That's a movie trailer version. It's the introduction uh, and then, you know, you have the opportunity over the course of the rest of the interview for them to ask further questions about that or, uh, you know, share your stories in greater depth. So tell me about yourself or walk me through your resume. The other remainder of the core questions there, again, listed on the page, highlighted in yellow. What are your short and long term career goals? Why MBA? Why now? Why Booth or why Sloan or why Tuck or why Haas, whatever the case may be. And there at the bottom, how will you uniquely contribute to Booth? Or how would you uniquely contribute to Booth? Or what can you uniquely bring to Booth? They can be worded in a variety of different ways. Be ready for that. Have a have an answer to that, um, and be ready for that for any school. We'll, we have to talk. We'll talk a little bit more about some extra strategy. Maybe even we'll do it. Uh, might even do it right now for goals. By the way, it just look some bullets here. This is tough to cover in depth on a, on a video. It's something we would cover in depth during actual interview prep together. Uh, a goals answer, short and long-term goals. I typically try to remind people there, you want to make sure you include what are your short-term goals, of course, what are your long-term goals, of course, and also the passion and purpose behind your goals. Why are these goals your goals? Why are you interested in tackling this problem? Where did this interest come from? This is stuff that would have hopefully been in, in some of your goals essays as well, like a booth number one. Um, Sloan didn't really ask about them. Uh, the order, by the way, the order of that delivery, it doesn't need to be short-term goals, long-term goals, why these goals are my goals. That order can vary by person and by circumstance, but those are the parts I, I'd like to make sure are in, uh, or I encourage people to make sure are in there. And you can see some of the other potential structuring to these uh Specificity, with, 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 with all of these, specificity is key. And specificity is not, being specific and concise at the same time is hard, but it's, it's not impossible and it's really the goal here. Specificity and succinctness, um, kind of a tongue teaser there. Uh, being specific and being concise at the same time. For why MBA, why now? Well, I just told you my goals in many cases. And as I look ahead to those goals, I've already got knowledge, skills, experience, A, B, C, D, uh, that give me a foundation to achieve them. Very brief about that. At the same time, however, I'm missing blank, blank, and blank. Uh, and that is why I'm, I, I believe I need an MBA. So I told you my goals, or I set the table with my goals. Um, I have knowledge, skill, experience, A, B, C, D, as I look ahead to these uh, but at the same time, I'm missing, and here's your YMBA. You're you're art crystallizing and articulating three or four key gaps for which the MBA is essential. And you want when you deliver those to be really specific about what that I call it EFGH here. It could be EFG, you know, XYZ, whatever you want to call it. Um, I call it EFGH because I'm kind of implying you've already got A, B, C, D, but you're missing EFGH. You're missing these gaps articulate them specifically, thoughtfully, and connect them to your goals. Don't just speak in genericisms. Connect them, deliver them in specific context of your goals. Why do you need that in order to achieve your goals? Uh, that means, by the way, if they haven't asked you your goals, you probably need to briefly preface this answer with a shorter, condensed version of your goals. Um, and there are different kinds of strategies around that. Again, too many to cover in a call like this, uh, but that's stuff that we would cover. How to be nimble between these questions in case they don't ask some of uh, some of these. Don't forget to answer the why now part of this question. Some people overlook that if it is asked. Why Booth? Why Sloan? Why whatever? Um, you got here's where, again, you have to know the school inside and out, not just the resources. You do need to know the resources that are relevant to you, but also the values, the culture, the community. What does the school stand for? What makes it unique? 
You want to channel those, that knowledge into a logical, personal, and multi-pronged argument. The same way you had multiple prongs to your YMBA, we want multiple prongs to this. Why booth? It should be several fold and it's going to be specific to you and you should hit different corners of the experience here again, be specific, but concise. Uh, don't laundry list e resources either. It's not a contest who can name the most stuff. You want to show that you know the school, but that you can deliver that in a manner that is tailored specifically to you and in a way that makes them also feel your interest and fit. Uh, we yeah, Sure, you want to be able to say some of the things about Booth that fit with your prep that you need to build toward and uh, your goals, but we also need to hear about the Chicago approach and Booth's pay it forward culture. Um, and as you know, as as hangs on the wall there in the Harper Center, why are you not here? Why are you here and not somewhere else? You you don't have to use that quote, um, but the ESO ethos of that. Really think about why there, whether it's Booth or Sloan or anywhere else, why there and not somewhere else. You don't and don't you know you have to don't knock other schools in this answer. Um, but really think about why there, why there, why there, why there. It's resources, but it's also things, these values, the culture, the community, what's in the air, what's in the water. Um, and you got to take all of this and turn it into a cogent, clear, logical argument that fits to you and also fits within a reasonable duration of response against probably something like two, two and a half uh, minutes. So don't, again, don't, yeah, that's a big trap people fall in with any of these questions or any interview questions is talking for too long. Uh, here, and I, that's from a guy who's talking probably for like an hour straight on this, on uh, this right here. So, uh, but, but, but specific, but concise, uh, and how will you uniquely contribute here? Again, you want to be super, super specific, thoughtful be, how will you uniquely contribute is not just, I want to join such and such a club. It's what role do you want in that club? And what are you going to do once you're there? What unique impact or imprint can you leave? And here again, you got to know about the school to 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 do this. You got to have ideally have done your homework. Um, is such and such a club really good right now at doing blank? But you see an opportunity for it to also grow into blank, or it's doing something on campus that you think would be effective. What is that idea? Tease that out. Develop a couple of those. Anchor them or root them in uh, unique experiences or skills or interests or passions that you have. Um, and think about two, maybe three of those or two big ones and a little one, two serious ones and a fun one. Whatever. Just think about what you're passionate about and what impact you can have. But it should be specific. Um, and again, there are some quirks here and some things where in more advanced interview prep that kind of goes beyond, I think, the scope of a video like this. Not every school is going to ask all of these questions and not every school is going to ask them in this particular order. So you have to be nimble around what if they skip a certain question or how do I merge? How do I weave in? How do I condense or where do I omit? Uh, if they don't ask the contributions question, is there an op? But I have a really good answer to it and I think it's going to be a big value add. Should I bake that into um, where can I deploy that? Should I bake my contributions into my why booth answer from the beginning? Some people do. So there are options like this, but from a preparation that, that we were, you need to kind of think through and we would need to talk through in, in, in a personalized interview prep session. Uh, but for purposes of this, just have these five core questions in mind walking into MBA, any MBA interview. Definitely here for booth. I think you could argue Sloan maybe is a a little less universal in asking all these. A lot of times they even say we're not interested. If you go on their website and their FAQs and look at their app, we're not really interested in your goals. They think that um, the best way to evaluate and get to know someone is from the experiences they've had and what they've done to this point. That's, you know, that's why their cover letter is what it is. That's why their video is what it is. Um, but they still, you still see enough in the way of goals, questions, uh, like, what are your goals? Why MBA? Why? So you'll still, you still see it in interviews. So it does come up and you definitely want to be ready for it um, if and when it does. So those are core questions. And again, we'll, we'll pull up something a little more specific for Booth and Sloan in a moment. Behavioral questions. What do we mean by that and how to approach those? Tell me about it. So again, behavioral questions, kind of a funny word. One that I think when I was an MBA applicant back in the day, uh, I kind of heard that word. I was like, what does that even mean? It just means it's an example driven question. How did you behave in a certain scenario? Tell, and oftentimes the most common framing or verbalization of that is tell me about a time when, 
share an example of mo probably mostly tell me about a time when you'll sometimes even see people in interview reports or in MBA forums abbreviated T T M A T. Tell me about a time. Uh, so it is a common enough phrase and that's kind of the indicator or anything related to an example. Tell me about a time when you challenged the status quo. Tell me about a time you worked with a diverse group. Tell me about a time you led a team. Now here's where we will see some real kind of dig deep patterns. If you hang on just a few more minutes, we'll pull up the even more specific Booth and Sloan um, material uh, or pattern obser observation. Here, folks, I, I suggest build a mental bench of examples. Uh, let's actually hit the, hit the pause button on this and let, we'll pull up the questions and uh, some of the questions and some of the themes. And then I'll talk to you about some of these frameworks and such. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about building a mental bench of examples, how to diversify and choose those examples, and then some of the frameworking that you can think about uh, it, that will help inform your delivery of those examples. It's up there on the screen now, but we'll get into it verbally in just a moment. By self-awareness questions, that should say number three. Um, there's kind of a default handful I've got the five, what I view as kind of like the five main, what I call again, my own kind of nomenclature for this self-awareness questions for MBA interviews. What is your leadership style? What role do you typically play in a team? What are your main strengths? What are your main weaknesses? What words would your colleagues use to describe you? Or how would your colleagues describe you? Or how would your bosses describe you? So it's kind of a fab five there or a, or a default five. Again, leadership style, role in a team, strengths, weaknesses, or adjectives almost. Uh, and we'll talk about those a little bit more in a moment when we pull up the uh, kind of uh, interview report, like an interview bank matrix uh, that I've prepared. Uh, there are spinoffs to these, by the way. And this is not, again, universal or... Um, totally comprehensive. Of course, it's just five questions, but uh, there are spinoffs of them. Like instead of what is your leadership style, it might be, what do you consider the are the qualities that are important in a leader uh, or who is a leader you admire most or why, but some sort of leadership style question often oriented toward you. What is your leadership style? But not always. Uh, what role do you typically play in a team? Again, you can have spinoffs there of like, um, uh, what qualities do you think are essential in a well-functioning team? So you could have these spin-offs, uh, strengths, weaknesses. It could be main strengths, main weaknesses. It could be three strengths, three weaknesses. It could be two. It could be main, it could be one. Uh, so you kind of have to have your hierarchy, but you want to know where you would go walking into an interview. Where would I go with strengths? Where would I go with weaknesses? And we could talk about the other one that's on there uh, in just a moment. Again, we're going to leave this presentation. So I'm just going to remind you uh, that we, you know, invite you to sign up for interview prep, of course. Uh, probably even easier if you email, if you are interested, email info at avantiprep.com. Uh, you know, what school are you interested in prepping for? Um, what's the date of your interview? That sort of thing. You can email info at avantiprep.com or you can sign up directly on the website. And again, we'll put that up with the coupon code. Uh, today. So I'm going to switch screens over to uh, some specific questions. If you bear with me for just a moment here. Where am I going? I'm going for uh, Let's see. I think we got the right one. It might need to be a, there we go. Okay. So the first thing I just pulled up here and I think we'll be able to toggle. Yes, we can. Uh, just a brief, a quick look. This is the, the link that I shared before to GMAT clubs, interview debriefs. This I think is one of the more effective ones you'll find. The link again is there up on the screen. Uh, make sure by the way, there's this drop down here in the top, right? Make sure you filter for, um, for the school that you're interested in looking for and make sure that that's what comes up. It actually don't think it filtered there. Let's reload the page. 
and now pull for booth. Okay, you'll see the dates of these these interviews and you know question reports and sometimes some statistics and the person's result and that kind of thing. So it is a nice raw um, resource. Some schools will have more and more recent interview reports than others, but you know if you're kind of starting uh, starting somewhere from a preparation or familiarity perspective, there's a, a question pattern building kind of perspective. There's a good starting point. Do the same for Sloan or any school you're interviewing with, and there are other resources uh, out there as well. And again, these aren't trade secrets. These are things that are readily readily um readily and publicly available commonly discussed in webinars school videos maybe not with the extreme level of granularity that i think an applicant should undertake during their prep but they're still going to give you there's interview tips conversations with current students this stuff is all kind of commonly discussed it what we're really doing here is putting a framework around it to aid in your prep. And that's what we're going to take a look at uh, here as I share my screen. Once again, it's kind of funny sharing your screen like this, right? Um, okay, so the, what I've done here, and uh, somebody let me know, I guess we have the admin let me know if for some reason it's not, I'll zoom in a little bit more. Uh, if it's not viewable or if the font's too small or something like that, maybe I could even go a little bit more. Uh, there again is the link at the top of the page. So we saw core questions a moment ago, and I talked about five of them. Walk me through your resume or tell me about yourself. What are your goals? Why MBA? Why now? Why our school? And how will you uniquely contribute? You'll see these basically here. And by the way, what did I do here? I went through many ma many interview reports. And just kind of organized or clustered them. Sometimes, by the way, you'll see the way I've clustered them too. And I would encourage you to do this. Walk, so you're going to see the same question asked slightly different ways. Walk me through your resume or tell me about yourself or introduce yourself. It's the same question. It's the common kind of opening question that you will see for um, for certain, uh, for many, many schools, including Booth. You'll see there highlighted in red, by the way. Uh, Sloan's version. Any updates since you've applied? Has anything changed since you've applied? You'll see these patterns again as you look through interview reports and consume, watch videos, consume publicly available uh, information. Other observations on here, uh, you know, something I did not cover during the core questions because I think those core five are the anchors. But now as you go through interview reports, you're going to see other patterns. And here I've highlighted what I call resumes, resume or experience probing. School, You're going to see in these in interview reports that schools commonly ask, both Booth and Sloan included, maybe Sloan a tiny bit more, um, like meaning like Sloan might ask you two of these questions and Booth might only ask you one. Uh, some sort of follow-up. You introduce yourself but maybe early on, maybe later in the interview. There's going to be some sort of probing or clarifying kind of questions. Tell me more about your current role. What do you do in a typical day? Um, Sloan, so, and you'll see some of, again, the specific patterns here or specific school specific observation. What do you like about your current job or industry? What's your favorite part of your current job? How has your organization performed in the last year? These are, these are fairly common and straightforward probes, but again, it, and, and, and the potential universe of questions about your experiences, you know, the booth interviewer has your resume. They could theoretically ask you anything about anything on it, any bullet on it. The old adage is to be able to speak to or respond to anything that's on your resume. Sloan, they've seen your whole app. So you should be able to speak to, respond to, and theoretically be prepared to answer anything. Now, there's not much prep you can do for that. You're not going to sit there and go line by line and say, well, how would I answer a specific interview question about this? That would be a, uh, there would be big time diminishing, which would be an inefficient use of your preparation time to do that. But you should look, like read through your application one more time, just so it's fresh and you remember what was in there. Watch your video that you submitted one more time so it's fresh and you're in there. Read over your resume so it's fresh and you know what's in there. Um, and have a sense of the potential 
clustering or patterns of questions here. Again, we see some observations about from Sloan specifically, uh, but really for both of these schools, a little like some sort of clarifier about your your current role or what you do at your company or what you do on a day to day basis. Sloan maybe even an extra lean toward organizational performance or um, what you like about your current job or industry, your favorite part of your current job. There's kind of that favorite or like dislike orientation. So those are, again, some lenses through which you can think, or again, in that pattern identification from a, from a pattern identification standpoint or question frequency standpoint, you might see some of this. Goals we talked about, why MBA, why now? We talked about, again, you see, you're going to see different kind of semantically worded versions. Uh, instead of why MBA, they might say, why, what do you want to learn from the MBA and why is now the right time? Well, they just asked why MBA, why now? Why Boother? Why Sloan? Um, I've got a couple of other questions under here. Sub questions. What is your view on the Chicago approach? What courses do you want to take? What clubs do you want to join? You'll see those occasionally show up in interview reports. Um, my view on that usually is that you're seeing those in the interview report because the, the person who was interviewed failed to proactively include them in their initial why Booth response, in this case, Booth. Uh, like the Chicago approach and not just naming it, you should understand it, make it your own, articulate it in context of your goals. The Chicago approach should probably be part of your why booth answer, not in a programmatic or robotic way. And not just because Greg's telling you to do it, um, understand it, read about it, um, make it yours and and not just the Chicago approach either in your answer to their many, many elements of Booth's culture. And both of these schools, by the way, have very specific and nuanced cultures. I think they have some of the most interesting and organic cultures of any MBA programs out there. So there's really an even extra layer and like almost a je ne sais quoi to it, if I may. Um, in terms of uh, like getting to know those cultures, it's, it's something you can read about, but you really need to feel also. Um, look back at that. At what I, I love for MIT Sloan is the preamble paragraph. If you remember doing your cover letter for them, look back at that. Pre look at a lot more resources than that. But look back at that preamble paragraph to the cover letter. Uh, there's a lot in there. Really dissect it word by word and phrase by phrase who they're looking for. Uh, and then, you know, same thing again with, with Booth and beyond just those couple of resources. But when you see questions, taking it back to the interview reports and question patterns, when you see things like this, what is your view on the Chicago approach? What courses do you want to take? What clubs do you want to join? Those elements should likely be already woven, not ad nauseum. It doesn't mean you have to name like eight courses, but appropriately worded, appropriately woven into a specific but concise delivery um, of why Booth or why Sloan, and there's where there's where specific but concise gets hard because you got you, you want to touch some different things with some depth and and with tailoring to you and that sense of mutual fit, but um, without laundry listing. So keep that in mind. Again, you, you're going to see questions sometimes in interview reports. Okay, it's nice to see them have them in the corner of your eye, but sometimes they're just reminders in my view, like, hey, that's stuff that should be in your answer initially. And the person, the interviewee who is reporting those is reporting them because they probably didn't include them in their initial response. So the interviewer was like, well, okay, thanks, but like, tell me more. What about the Chicago approach? What about courses? What about clubs? Um, I think the, the person who posted this one, it, it didn't bode well for them. It wasn't the result they hoped. Uh, and, you know, that could be an indicator, you know, make sure these things are proactively in there. Uh, how will you contribute to the school? I've got it highlighted in gray here. Again, I was talking about this a little bit before. Not every school will ask this. Um, but I think if you have a strong, and you should have a strong and specific idea about how you can uniquely impact the school, you've got some strategic decisions to make about um, whether you want to proactively bake that into your original why Booth or why Sloan answer, should it be one of like, if you have three pillars to that answer, should it be one of the pillars? Uh, there's an argument for that. And some people like that. Other people will say, you know, I got enough to cover with why Booth. 
I'm going to have my kind of like three pillars of Y booth. And then I'm going to actively transition or toward the end of my Y booth response. I'm going to take a brief pause and say, and you know, I'm also happy to share how I believe I can uniquely contribute to booth in the spirit of its pay it forward culture. And then go into your contributors, kind of use a, it's like you had your pillars for Y booth and now I'm pivoting it into the, my contributions. Other people will hold it, see if they get the question. And then maybe if we look at the end here, some schools like, you know, some schools toward the very end will ask, uh, is there anything else you would like to know before we wrap up? Now, that's not a guarantee you get that question either, but you could use it there if you fail to use it elsewhere. Um, but if you have good contribute, you, you, I don't think if you're going to talk school specifics, you want to include somewhere in the interview. You don't want to walk out of the interview without saying how you will also give to the school. Otherwise, it's going to sound like you're just taking. So that's something to really flag. You don't always get the exact question. So maybe then you're saying, okay, well, I should put this in my Y Booth or Y Sloan response. How do you make it fit? How do you make it work in terms of duration of response and not overwhelm them and not drag the answer on and on forever? That's, you know, again, more advanced than personal stuff. You'll see, again, these, some of these one-offs like Booth. You know, I think once in a while you'll see what do you think will be the most challenging part of your time at Booth? It's, you know, um, it's something that comes up. It could come up for Sloan, too. You never know. Uh, but, you know, I think I've, I've seen it corner of my eye a little bit more for Booth. You see it for some other schools as well. If I could use a metaphor, it's from a preparation standpoint. I think of it as kind of like a page two question, meaning your page one questions are the ones that you feel like show up a lot. Page two questions, I want to be ready for them and have, you know, have thought a little bit about it at least. Um if it comes, but it doesn't seem to come quite as much. Page two, kind of from a preparation standpoint. Self-awareness questions. We, we looked at the five most common. Leadership style, role you play in a team, um, strengths, weaknesses, and what words would people use to describe you. You know, this is a section that Sloan does not operate heavily in. Uh, I would say that Sloan is primarily in the behavioral questions and um, the core or some version of the core. Booth, you do see these a bit more. Um, I would say for Booth, the ones in blue I have here a little feel a little more common to me. I mean, this is totally like back of the uh, uh, nothing that my op, my observation of patterns is based on nothing that you can't do yourself. So if you poured yourself into um, reading interview reports, reading school resources, re watching school videos, you're going to come up with your own observations on these as well from a preparation standpoint. You know, I see a little bit, you know, I think a leadership question during a booth interview feels, feels pretty common. Um, the strengths and weaknesses, I think you'll see bubbling up. It doesn't mean these others don't come. Like what words do you think others would use to describe you or what role do you typically play in a team or some of the spinoffs, like what is your ideal team? Uh, but Sloan seems to operate a little bit less in this space. I have seen for Sloan something like, what is your communication style? A little bit different. That's not quite leadership style, of course. That's communication style. But those are some of the school-specific patterns. Um, and again, some of the spin-offs, spin-off versions uh, that you might want to think about. Behavioral. This is where it gets even more fun. Um, schools. I think just in general, again, not nothing like there's no, there are no like uh, trade secrets here. If you just asked somebody or went on a, you know, MBA interview discussion board, there's, there are things like big, like for behavioral questions, types of tell me about a time questions. There's a pretty standard slate out there that you could probably just think of on your own. Like they might ask me what my biggest accomplishment is or about a time I failed or about a time I worked in a diverse group or about a time I led a team or about a time I uh, challenged the status quo and so on and so forth. I think all we've done here is try to take that one degree further in terms of specificity. Uh, and you can take, you can basically do exactly what I've done here through all, again, these school resources and publicly available resources and alumni that you speak with or students that you speak with um uh, you know i think it would be weird to ask them like what questions get asked there? okay you don't do that but um you will you you can gain a fairly specific sense of what schools might be interested in some of them even in certain cases have 
uh, tips like on their website. You should think about working in teams. You should think about experiences you've had leading teams. You should think about experiences you've had working in diverse teams. You'll be able to uh, pick up on these patterns. Here, I've just clustered some of those patterns that, that I've observed along the way and in you know the last couple of rounds and that sort of thing. Uh, biggest accomplishment. So, so you'll see, again, I've got kind of in bold the theme or the behavioral topic. Uh, and then some of the different ways it might be asked. And there are nuances to that. So biggest accomplishment. I think both of these schools could, you do see both of them ask a biggest accomplishment. What is your biggest accomplishment? Where do you think you've generated the most impact? Um, Sloan sometimes puts like a little bit of a recent framing around that, a recent accomplishment. Um, what's your biggest accomplishment in the last 12 months? So just be ready for some of those nuances. You'll see other patterns around changing your perspective. That's something um, you see, I, I think Booth have more of an orientation for. You should know that already going in. Booth, you're going to have to, if you've been invited to interview, one of your video choice options, the 60 second video that you submit along, like while before you do the interview or concurrently, I guess, um, depending on the date of your interview, is about changing your perspective. Tell me about a time you change. You've already seen this from Booth. Uh, and maybe you even answered it already for Booth. And here now you're going to, you could be asked it in an interview. Uh, bringing people together or um, managing diverse points of view, working in a team with different points of view, working in diverse teams, persuading others, motivating others. Fail. Tell me about a time you failed. That's something going into any MBA interview. Really, a lot of these themes are uh, overcoming a challenge or facing a challenge uh, and succeeding, resolving conflict or working with a difficult colleague. Giving help. Tell me about a time you helped someone. Tell me about a time you mentored someone. Asking for help. Uh, maybe a little bit more of a booth bubble. Not super common in my view, but you do. I've seen it. Tell me about a time you realized you needed help. Tell me about a time you were overwhelmed. What did you do? How did you handle it? And then again, there's this whole other suite of potential behavioral questions. You can, by the way, drive yourself nuts. And I would caution against that. Um, you're going to see one-off behavioral questions of all stripes. You might see, tell me about a time you helped drive a project to success. Tell me about a time you said no to an opportunity. Um, there's so many different behavioral questions that you could be asked. There are diminishing returns from a preparation standpoint to try to like think of responses in advance for every single possible one you might get. I think the more important thing is to... Uh, kind of have a feel for what the major or most common ones are. Maybe at a school, you'll, you'll see some little tiny leans for a certain school. Ooh, that, they really seem to ask that one a lot. Uh, and, um, and have, again, you might have that kind of mental page one, page two, uh, the main, you know, six or eight behavioral type questions that you think a certain school asks, maybe some backups. But by the way, the answer, the examples that you have in your head for those first six or eight, they probably, if you have that mental bench of examples ready, you're probably good. You're probably good for any behavioral questions they could throw at you. And by the way, you could always, you've lived your life. You can always, um, you know, think of an example right there on the, on the spot as well. Other miscellaneous or closing kind of questions doesn't mean they necessarily come at the end. It's more just kind of a miscellaneous category. Uh, Sloan, you'll have done a 250 a data viz and a 250 word essay about it. Uh, I think it's 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 fairly common for them to ask about that a question about that in your interview. You've just done it; should be fresh. Um, what do you do outside of work? Is a fairly common. You know, you might have covered it a little bit in your opener. Tell me about yourself, but maybe a deeper dive about it. Or what do you do for fun? Or how do you give back to the community? Or maybe they key in on a certain community thing you've worked on or extracurricular on your resume. A um, little less common for these schools, but you know, probably some things you want to, well, at least this one, where else are you applying? Uh, maybe kind of a page two, or at least look at the tea leaves, school specific. Some schools, some schools you will see ask this quite often. Uh, and there it's kind of a page one question for those schools, meaning you should be ready for it. Doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get it, but you really should be ready for it. You should be ready for it no matter what. In these cases, I want to call it probably a page two question. Be ready for it just in case. Know where you're going to go with it if you want to be on your toes. Um, but, you know, if you're allocating probabilities, 
I think they're on the, the lower end probably for, the, for these schools. Is there anything else you would like me to know? This is uh, for some schools an all the time kind of last question before they give it to you to ask them questions. But uh, uh, you know, I don't see it quite as an all the timer for these schools, but it's still something to keep in mind. What if they ask me this question toward the end? Is there anything else you would like me to know? Is there anything else? Is there a question you wish I would have asked uh, before we wrap up? Is, you know, is there anything else you want to share with the admissions committee or for me to note down? Have a plan for that. I think the two main strategies that I have in my mind for that are A, to truly use it as a safety valve question. Meaning if there was something I really wanted to share or feel like I didn't get across during the main part of the interview, here's my chance. It's a safety valve. If, if the, that contributions question never came. And you realize, gee, I, I, in your head, I talked a lot about, uh, you know, earlier we, in the interview, we talked a lot about uh, why Booth. One thing I would like to, to take the opportunity to communicate before we wrap up here is how I believe I can uniquely contribute to or impact it. Like, so, oh, I didn't get to share my contributions in detail. That was a miss. Here's my safety valve. Here's my chance to do that. Um, if there's a certain weakness or something or glaring issue or something weird with your app or your situation, here's a chance to cover that. And if, if, if none of the above apply, what we don't want to do here is just put our hands in our pockets and say, oh, no, that's it. I think we're fine. I think that's it. Use the question. Use it as an opportunity to um, say something interesting, to close, to reiterate your interest, to like a closing paragraph almost. You don't have to repeat verbatim what you said earlier, but you know, I, I think we've uh, covered most of what I was ho hoping to cover and I really appreciate your questions and your time. Uh, I would just like to use this opportunity to reiterate that for all the reasons you know, I described earlier, from blank to blank, to blank to blank, to blank to blank, I really and truly believe, you know, make that your own and close with it. So that's a strategy again for this. Is there anything else you'd like me to know question? Is it a safety valve? to cover something you hoped you would have covered but didn't, or if you really do feel like you covered everything, how can I use it as a close? Sometimes you can do both of those if you can be kind of efficient in your verbiage uh, and, and in your timing. Do you have any questions for me? That's uh, that could take us down a whole different road, but let's just wrap up here in the next like couple of minutes. I'm gonna switch back to the presentation for one sec, and then I'll take your questions. All right, thank you for bearing with me here. There we go. Uh, we're going to go to the behavioral questions again because I, I didn't cover this as much as I intended. Um, so those behavioral questions, we looked just a second ago at some of the patterns or some of the categories of behavioral questions that we see bubble up a little bit more for Booth and Sloan. And we saw there were little kind of tweaks and twists uh, or patterns between them. Uh, again, Sloan might ask you, I think for these schools, you might expect something like two to four behavioral questions. You know, for Sloan, maybe it's more four and for Booth, it's like three or some interviewers only ask you two. I have had people, and there's all manner, like I've had people, I had a, a, <laughs> worked with an applicant once who in a Sloan interview, back when they referred to their interviews as behavioral interviews, it, like, explicitly on their website, he was not asked a single behavioral question. So you never know, but those are the typical, uh, those are the typical kind of thing. You know, I would say two to four behavioral questions. Maybe Sloan leans a little more toward the four and Booth is like two or three, but be ready for them. We looked at some of the co common themes, uh, how to approach from a preparation standpoint, uh, build a mental bench of examples. I've used that phrase a few times now, build a mental, mental bench of examples, meaning have a shelf in your head of like the strongest stories and obviously relevant to the question stories that you're ready to pull off that shelf and user deploy verbally in the interview. Obviously, again, it can't be a it shouldn't be a random shelf. They should be interesting stories and good stories and ones that fit the question. But build that mental bench of examples. I, I it's a little maybe pen and paper old school of me, but sometimes I say to people, it's probably the way I would still do it. Um, take a piece of paper. You could take a piece of paper, fold it into four. And now on the front and the back, you have four quadrants in there. And you can try to pin down stories anecdotes. Again, these should be delivered verbally in like a two, two and a half 
like maybe max three kind of minute things. So you're not, you don't want to drag the story or tell them, you know, an endless story, but have those nuggets, have those stories ready, draw from a mix of experiences. So we don't want like, you don't want to over allocate where like every time they ask a behavioral question, you're talking about like, certainly the same project, but even maybe the same job, like try to have some diversity if you can. I mean, use your best stories, but try to have some diversity to them. If you're able to step outside of work with some of those stories, if there's a community project um, that you've, uh, that you've done that, you know, you could fit with, with one of them, choose the examples wisely and unpack the value. Meaning don't overlook the value in so same thing with like working on a resume. Um, I feel like sometimes people will gloss over really interesting elements of the story. Like, you know, they worked with, and again, obviously the story has to fit the question or the topic that's being asked about, but you know, they, they'll briefly mention or like almost not even met is they worked with like this super duper international team that was made up of people from like eight countries. And they'll only like briefly mention that. Like, Wait a second. That's a really interesting part of the story. Make sure you're unpacking the value. Oh, sorry. Think through the different things and the different themes that are in there. And obviously, again, orient toward the question that's being asked. And then finally, the, what I call the SCARL framework. Uh, that's, again, my own little device. It's basically a variation of situation, action, result or situation, task, action, result, which you will hear as the very common um, star method or SAR method, uh, very common rubric for answering behavioral questions. It's a little bit of my own spin on it, which I think can be more effective for MBA interviews. Uh, situation and challenges, you got to set the table, set the context, who, what, when, where. Um, think like you just met this person and, or, you know, if you like walked into a bar or a coffee shop and we're telling a stranger about one of these examples, you have to set the table. Like it was two years ago, I had been recently promoted to vice president um, and was assigned the responsibility of building out our blank. Uh, like set the table. Obviously, again, you have to make sure the story is answering the topic question, behavioral question that's being asked. But the beginning of the story, situation or challenges, the middle of the story, actions. I repeat it multiple times as a reminder um, to not just sweep through the actions. Let's have... Think of the steps. You don't want the story to drag forever, but think of the steps. First, we did this. Then we did this. Then we did this. Think of the steps in there. I think sometimes I hear behavioral responses and the person says, yeah, we met and everything was great. And I say, it sounds like they waved a magic wand and everything was resolved. Um, well, if you had a conflict with a coworker working or had to resolve a team or manage to differing opinions, what are the actual, what are the step? You didn't just wave a magic wand and everything was great. First, we did this. Then I did this. Then we did this. Um, have some action, some layering to those actions. And then finally, the results. I've got it in parentheses here. I think it's worth briefly mentioning. But more important than the results, you know, results, yeah, we do want to know how the story ended. But the lessons or the insights or the takeaways, even if the behavioral question does not say, what did you learn? Oftentimes it won't. It's implied. Um, or at least I think if you were giving an effective response, it should be implied. So you can see there again, the SCARL, what I call the SCARL framework. Um, you can kind of break it into parts, by the way, MIT Sloan's old interview page on their website. I don't think it's any longer there. They used to talk about, they had a line on there that I thought was great. Every story has a beginning, a middle and an end. Every story has a beginning a middle and an end. I think you can can think about the SCARL framework and deliver it ver and think about your stories and then verbally deliver them on interview day in a similar manner as that. The beginning of the story is the situation and perhaps the challenges. You're setting the table. The middle of the story are the actions and the end of the story are the results and the lessons or the takeaways. Um, so beginning, middle, and end. Situation challenges, actions, 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 results, lessons, behavioral questions. Um, let's take a few minutes now for questions. Will this be posted on YouTube? Yes, I believe it will. The uh, GMAT club will. Um,
I'm going to just put up while I look for these questions. Again, you can go to avantiprep.com and sign up for services directly. I'll uh, activate that coupon code shortly or and or email info at avantiprep.com. If you'd like to work together in interview prep, you could let me know for which school and what the dates of the interview are. We could figure out um, what works. Um, please post it in the chat box. I don't think we have any uh, super specific questions uh, here, um, but we will do. Uh, we will do a. Um, you know, in other formats, I believe I will potentially be doing some live or open Q and A's uh, interview info or tips for pre MBA interview questions at Sloan. I think it's just, I, it, it's such a, di it's a whole nother ball of wax. Um, with that, I think it kind of goes, oh, we could, we could go into the booth video. We could go into the, um, you know, I, I think be, it's just going to sound so generic, like be thoughtful about what you pick. Um, be specific about the takeaways and I believe there are actually two different ways they can answer you can answer that um there's like two sub questions within it um I would be specific in your takeaways I would think sometimes think outside the box to like what's yes this is what the data viz is telling me but maybe what what's it not telling me or what else would be interesting to know um why again is it important to you that's, you know, part of, uh, I think, some of the verbiage of the question. So it's super generic. It's hard to kind of deliver, I think, a nuanced response to that in such a uh, tight time. Um, how, to, how to feel when the interviewer asks specifically about a certain topic several times? That question, you know, I think it's uncommon. Um, I think that's fairly uncommon if... Uh, the interviewer asking about a certain topic several times. I, I don't really see that happen. I mean, if, if somebody, I guess there could be a case where if somebody like, if I asked why booth and I didn't feel like I got enough of an answer, I might then say, well, but tell me more. Like, is there anything about booth culture? Is there anything about the Chicago approach? Is there anything about courses or clubs or conferences or extracurriculars? That would be because somebody's original answer was insufficient. Uh, and I'm giving them kind of a, an at bat. I think the interviewer would still probably judge negatively if your original answer didn't include those things. But I, I don't think you're really going to get hammered on the same theme every time. Some of the behavioral questions, sometimes um, the themes overlap and they can feel kind of adjacent or similar. And by the way, those those the, the mental bench of examples that you come up with from a preparation standpoint each example you have on your bench or in your head, it, it doesn't have to be engineered toward only one possible behavioral question. Sometimes the story can, you know, a leadership story can also be your overcame a challenge story or your question the status quo story, if that was part of what you led. A motivating a motivation story could also be a persuasion story. A difficult colleague story could also be a resolved conflict story. Your, your mental bench of examples should have some nimbleness or flexibility to it. Some of the topics can overlap, but I think it would be rare for them to, you know, ask about the same thing several times. Um, and, uh, you know, we keep getting a couple of questions here about, you know, uh, booth videos or um, these things that are adjacent to the interview. Booth videos, uh, data, you know, we, we do work with applicants through our hourly services platform on those things as well. So if people are interested in, uh, in, in, in advice or, you know, more specific advice on those, we do provide services related to them that are adjacent to our interview prep service. So the interview prep would cover the interview and the interview preparation. Um, but if you'd also then like guidance, feedback, et cetera, on my booth video, 60 second video that I need to submit by Feb 22 and, or, um, the the uh, extra essay, the data viz for 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 MIT Sloan. We do offer that through our hourly services platform. 
we could probably even discount that a bit um, if somebody were also working with us on interview prep. So we hope that helps. Uh, thank you for joining today. Another in our interview series, this time covering Booth and Sloan. We wish you the best of luck. Um, and please do reach out info at avantiprep.com or by visiting our website and signing up for interview prep directly, avantiprep.com. Um, if you are interested in working together on interview prep, we basically take, uh, <laughs> take, uh, take what we did here today and obviously make it super. We do a mock interview in the style of the school and then go through it all and question by question feedback strategy, workshopping, 5% discount. Um, uh, and again, I think the, the reviews that are out there, the testimonials that are out there will speak to the thoroughness, the level of specificity and the positive impact that that has on people's preparation and real thoughtfulness dot connecting for the interview itself. So thank you again for joining. We wish you the very best of luck. Please feel free to reach out if we can uh, aid in any in interview prep um, or anything else along the way. Hope you have a great day.